If you like Halliburton or Ultra Petroleum, then we've got some stocks you'll love. It's time to go digging for value. I'm Alison Southwick, and I am joined today by Taylor Muckerman and Joel South, energy analysts here at The Motley Fool. So let's get to our top story, shall we? Let's shall. Let's shall. Well, we're going to go to the Wall Street Journal. Big news. For the first time in 18 years, U.S. oil production exceeded imports in October. The article made a pretty big deal about how this is a big deal. I think they had about a two-paragraph wind-up. Mm -hmm. So are they right? How big of a deal is this? This is a big deal. I mean, if you're People are always talking about energy independence. To get there, this is something that they need to, that will need to actually happen. You need to produce enough to actually use. So it is a big deal because we haven't seen this actually happen in 18 years. And you can imagine what happened, you know, at that time, yep. 18 years ago. You know, the Grateful Dead was still a band. Uh, <laughs> so you know, there's a lot that's happened since then. And you know, this is kind of a week of first. If you also look at the Bakken, it also moved into the one uh, million barrel per day club of oil. Uh, something that's you know we really haven't seen in the United States in a long time. So we're seeing a new field reach that level, and you're seeing companies like Continental Resources really take over. They have 1.2 million uh, net acres in that area. You've seen production growth from that company just soar. Uh, so you're seeing companies really target that area, and that's why it's now one of the bigger plays. And also with that production, that's why we're producing more than we're actually importing them. Right. So how do you invest for this? So what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the next 18 years. You know, obviously the, the companies like EOG and the Eagle Ford have their acreage, but there's also new companies that are really moving in that are uh, going to be really a lot of the primary drivers for increased oil. And one of them is Pioneer Natural Resources. They, are, they have the best acreage like Continental and EOG in their respective fields. It's called the, uh, the Sprawberry Wolf Camp. And this is actually a play that... Uh, their CEO, Scott Sheffield, thinks is not only the second biggest play in America, the second in the world. Mm -hmm. He thinks that this has potential right now of 50 billion barrels of oil. He says as people start, ta uh, especially their company, as they start drilling, this could reach to 75, even to 100 billion barrels of oil. So obviously this is a huge play. They're seeing tremendous growth. Uh, a lot of the wells that they've put on the last year have really uh, outperformed. So that's a company I'm looking for to be that next huge driver in a new play. And you can also look at one of the old Conoco, uh, just Conoco. Uh, they're a company that is really targeting a number of fields, and they're also moving and, and getting a lot of oil out of the Gulf of Mexico. So that's another company that I think will be one of the huge drivers going forward. Yeah, talking about Pioneer, um, the CEO of Coral Labs actually spoke about them identified them in their last conference call as being one of the more technologically advanced companies. And uh, also, you know, he, he called out that play in particular as, as leading the charge. It's funny you say that on Jim Cramer, uh, Scott Sheffield, oh, yeah. ha, uh, recently had a, I think it was last week, he was on that show and he was talking about Core Labs really doing great work to make them <laughs> that great. So obviously great relationship between back those two there. companies. Right. All right. Well, let's move on to our next sure. story. The chairman and CEO of National Oil Well, Barco, is stepping down as soon as the company spins off their distribution mm -hmm. business. Pete Miller isn't going far. The longtime CEO will become the executive chairman of that spinoff. Yes, so the stock didn't really move on the news. I think it's up like maybe a percent or so. Um, probably because this has been in the works for a while, right? Yeah. People have known about this for a long time. And generally, if this was like a surprise, it would be a shock to the investors because he's 2012 CEO of the year, according to Morningstar. And we actually had a chance to sit down with him in Houston and interview him the day after they announced this spinoff. So uh, great guy, very humble, and uh, really contributed so much to where, where they're at right now. So Ensco's CEO is also stepping down uh, this year. Doesn't seem like there's as much of a succession plan. How concerning is that? Yeah, it's, they've been looking for a successor for the past year or so, and they still haven't found one. So you look at uh, Dan Rayburn, ready to stick around until they do find a successor. He'll be part of the, the party that looks for someone to take his place. Um, this is a gentleman who oversaw the Pride acquisition, really changed the entire face of the organization, and uh, been very successful. They're the number one company in customer satisfaction, and they have the youngest deep water fleet. Although some competitors are euthanizing, or not youth, <laughs> making their fleets more youthful. Sorry, trying to make up a word there on the spot. Um, but uh, So <laughs> take a look at what he's done. Got the company in a great position um, compared to competitors, and I really like it. I'm a shareholder, and I'm not worried at all. All right, now we're going to head over to the Atlantic. They took a look at why gas prices are falling, and while they give a nod to fuel-efficient cars and people like us who live in city, you're still smiling over you, <laughs> euthanizing, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, while they give a nod to fuel-efficient cars and um, 
you know, like I said, people like us who choose to use public transportation and things like that. They suggest that the dynamic of diesel prices in Europe is what's driving down gas prices. Joel, is that really the, the story here? Yeah, definitely it is. I mean, if you look at the amount of, of exports that we're sending to countries all over the world, it's really soared. I mean, if you look at 2010 compared to recent numbers, you're seeing uh, exports reach about 3.8 uh, billion barrels of product a day. Uh, that's a 65% increase. So you're seeing a lot of uh, companies shipping uh, the diesel over to, like we've mentioned, overseas. And basically what, what that's doing is when you go and crack a barrel of oil, you're getting diesel, you're getting gasoline, you're getting, getting residuals. So as the, you, people target those higher margin diesels that they're shipping, you're still getting a lot of gasoline. So you're getting more of a surplus of gasoline, more than we are using. So obviously fuel efficiency she helps, but having that um, extra gas from the diesel that's actually being shipped is really uh, causing the drop in prices. So we have the refiners to thank for the, lo the lower lower gas prices here. Who who specifically is is driving this? Yeah, definitely. You have refiners, and you also have some of your midstream companies. If you look like a, a company, uh, Enterprise Product Partners, this is a company that recently converted two of their docks. Each dock will basically be able to export either gasoline or some product like diesel. Uh, each dock is about 360,000 barrels per day of export capacity. So that should be, go on in the next few years. That's like one of the companies that will really grow uh, in the future and help gas prices stay low. Then you're looking at other companies like Valero. Uh, 15 to 20% of all the diesel that they crack is exported. And they're one of the biggest exporters in the United States. They export about 20 to 25% of gasoline and diesel. So that's one of the big players right now. Philip 66 is another one. They uh, This last quarter exported about 190,000 barrels per day. Um, they have capacity to move that up to 360. They actually are looking to do that very soon, and they're looking to grow their capacity ex exponentially from there over the next several years. So you're going to see this continually go on um, over the long term. All right, let's move over to Bloomberg, where they are reporting on how Shell is looking to slim down. Mm -hmm. The company is looking to sell about fifteen billion yeah. in assets. Sounds like a lot. It sounds like yeah. a lot, right? Anything with a B still sounds like a lot to me. Although I realize that's less and right. less every day. So, what are they looking to sell, mm -hmm. and what are they going to do with the money? So basically, Bloomberg has calculated that in order to fund capital expenditures that are planned for the next few years, based on projects that they currently have on the horizon, fifteen billion dollars is going to need to be sold off. And it's only around four percent of their of their assets. So it's not as much to this company, but you know that's still a mid cap company is worth. Of worth of money that they're selling off. Um, but I think that it's going to be a positive because they have so many projects on the horizon. Looking at other companies in their peer group, they've been cutting back on spending, either redistributing cash to shareholders in dividends or share buybacks, or just holding on to that cash. And you talk, and the CEO, CFO of Shell actually said that that's some short-termism on the, on the point on the hands of these companies, where Shell is looking more long-term, ready to spend. They already went $5 billion over 2013 expectations, up to $47 billion in net spending. So look for this company to continue. They have huge projects in Australia with their Prelude floating LNG, the first and biggest floating LNG facility, and their Gorgon project down there. So that right there is $30 billion that they're expecting to spend in Australia alone from 2011 to 2016. So they need this money and that's what they're going to use it for. So do you think it's the right strategy? I do. I agree with what they're trying to accomplish here. Uh, this is a company that clearly isn't going to divest any uh, of their segments. So if they could sell off some older assets, create a cleaner slate for the incoming CEO at the end of the year, Ben Van Bearden, I think that he's going to have some optionality here with directions that he can take the company uh, once the current CEO steps down. All right, that's going to cover it for the headlines. Now we're going to move on to a little segment we're going to call, if you like that, then you'll love this. It's not that complicated. If you are viewers like Halliburton or Ultra Petroleum, mm -hmm. Joel and Taylor have some stocks that you will love. Let's so, hope so, right? Let's yeah. hope so. Well, we'll, we'll see. Time so, will Joel. Sell. Um, if you like Ultra Petroleum, what stock are they going to love? So what I'm looking at is EQT Corp. Uh, the reason I like them, I mean, if you like Ultra Petroleum, you're there because they're a low-cost producer. Uh, if you look at the two, or the two main plays, one in Wyoming, the other in Marcellus, they basically can produce about $2.30 per thousand cubic feet. Obviously pretty solid. However, EQT is diversified not only by different plays, they have a number of businesses. Not only do they have six trillion cubic feet of re, uh, proven reserves, they also have EQT midstream, so they have that whole 11,000 
uh, miles of midstream that they can tackle. And then they also have a gas utility and equity, equitable gas. It's 275,000 uh, customers. They're actually looking to sell that off. That should boost their price as well. Uh, so they got a number of businesses that you're looking at. On top of that, just like Ultra Petroleum, they're a low-cost producer. They have plays all over the Marcellus. They're one of the best producers there. And if you look at their all-in costs, it's a little under two dollars, so they're actually a little bit better producers over the last three years. And you know, they're as you focus on one main play, you're getting better economics consistently. You're building those contracts. So I think this company, not only as a natural gas producer, low cost producer, but as a full business, if you look at all their different segments, is a better value. Mm -hmm. All right, Taylor, you've got Halliburton. If you love Halliburton, or if you like Halliburton, you're gonna love. Helmerich and Payne, it's also a driller, but they're so much more concentrated on the United States onshore drilling than Halliburton. When you look at Halliburton and its larger peers, you think Halliburton's more, concer more concerned with the progress here in the United States, but Helmerich and Payne even more so. Uh, over 80% of their business does come from that market, so um, they've, had a, they've had to weather out a couple of years here as natural gas prices have remained low, so production and drilling hasn't been as high as it was in the past. But this is a company that has some of the most efficient rigs in the business. Their cost per rig on a daily basis is going down. So if I continue, continue to see that trend, and if natural gas goes above $4 per million cubic feet, as the majority of expectations are for next year, then uh, land drilling here should really pick up. And they're the one that stands to benefit most directly and with a higher degree compared to Halliburton or Schlumberger. So I'm looking at this company. If you believe that rig counts will rise or that drilling will increase here in the United States, that's the company over the next three to five years. You know, I also like that as the, because they're a United States player and they have those high impact wells. Mm -hmm. As the plays, you know, as more people go into more shell plays that are more expensive, you're going to go out and spend more money, get those higher uh, day rate rigs because you're wanting the most for your investment. So I see companies that have some of the niche plays like that that's not so or not as global uh, could really be big time winners in mm -hmm. the next uh, five, ten years. Agreed. All right. Well, let's move on. Before we go, we're going to play everyone's favorite game, a little investing chicken. Oh. We've got Cocky the Investing Chicken, the is. mascot. And for those who haven't seen Investing Chicken before, how it works is I get to sit back and I get to watch these two guys talk each other out of owning stocks that they actually do currently mm -hmm. own. Yep. So what is going to happen is Taylor owns, no wait, Joel, you own Sandridge. Correct. Taylor gets three chances to talk you out of owning the stock. These are mounting problems. Mm -hmm. And at some point, mm -hmm. you're, you are going to either say you're going to sell, or if he can't talk you out of it, we want to hear about when you would sell on Sandridge. So first off, why don't you tell us what tell us why you, why you own Sandridge? Yeah, definitely. It's a company I got into when they had a lot of management problems and debt issues. I saw a tremendous value. Even if they were to liquidate their business, they were they were worth a lot more than they were selling for. So I bought them at a good level. Um, since then, I do like the new management that's in place. They sold off some assets. They're really focusing on their mid-con. Uh, they're really growing that area. You're looking at about 35% total production growth next year compared to uh, 2013. And of liquids, which is more profitable, 50% growth in that play. So you know, I still see an upside in this company. All right, Taylor, let's see what you can do. First first scenario. All right, well, typically they, they concentrate on the Mississippi and Lime, but they have some Woodford assets as well. And the first three wells that they drilled were non-commercial in production. So if you see these results continue, um, are you confident enough in the Mississippi and Lime to hold, or are you going to sell? Um, I will still hold. I still think that the Mississippi and Lime really is that uh, play that they're going to be focusing on. Plus, they could do some uh, joint ventures to really boost some, some money or to get some more money. Mm -hmm. And they have their uh, wastewater disposal throughout that play. So I still see more upside in the Mississippian, even though they've been burned by natural gas yeah. and some of those natural gas plays over the, the, since they've actually been a publicly mm -hmm. traded company. All right, that's number one. Number All two. Right, number two. They beat on EPS, but growth wasn't as high as they had thought in the last quarter. How mm -hmm. many more quarters are you going to give them until they can turn around? If you see the third quarter and the or the fourth quarter and the first quarter of 2014, with only low to single digit increases there, uh, are you still going to hold? Um, I will still hold. Um, I, I will still hold here. <laughs> Big guns on uh, number three. You know, at, at, the, at their current prices, I'll still hold there because they are still at a point where they could liquidate a number of their businesses. They have that offshore drilling uh, when they had uh, Dynamic Offshore that they purchased. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that they could throw in there. And with that in the Mississippian, I still think they're uh, valued, there will be valued more than they're currently trading at. Okay. All right, last, last chance. One. Last chance. So these are compounding effects. So if both of their uh, plays aren't growing as expected, their debt to equity ratio is much higher than peers. Yep. 
their cash flow has slowly started to, it's growing, but it's not growing as, as highly as it is yep. quarter over quarter. So if you continue to see this downward trend in cash flows from operations to, to pay off these debt levels, are you still holding? I will not still hold. I think I would sell there. They have $1.65 billion in liquidity. However, if they're losing money, there's not much of an operation anymore. So I think that's the point where I would sell on top of having some of the, like you mentioned, some they did have some wells that were not uh, as productive as people want. Mm -hmm. So if that was pretty um, systematic throughout the Mississippian, plus losing money, yeah. uh, they would probably have to fire, uh, sell their assets at a fire sale and they would be worth less than they're trading right now. So yes, I would sell them. All right, so you got them. Chicken on this. You one. got them right, on the third so I gotta, one. I got to hold till three. All right, now, all right, now let's see, let's see how how we how we return it here. So now you get to talk Taylor out of Console Energy. So actually, why you like them? Tell us why you like them. I'll give a quick without pitch. giving too much away. Yeah. Uh, so basically, this was a company that I saw as a special situation in the coal market. Um, it's one of the oldest coal companies in the world since the Civil War. They've been producing coal, um, but they've started to move into natural gas because they've realized the decline that natural coal or that coal has been experiencing here in the U.S. Um, but they do have coal assets. They've sold off some of them uh, within the last month, mm -hmm. but they still have some core holdings and an export terminal on top of their coal bed and Marcellus uh, ethane and natural gas production. All right, All right. first, first possible scenario. You they are old. Three chances. Old. Three chances <laughs> to talk them out of it. Oh, so first. So one. so my first one. They still are a primarily thermal coal business. Mm -hmm. If you see a number of government regulations come on to utilities, uh, really cramps their business, mm -hmm. do you still like them? I do like them, um, but you know, reservations if, if uh, the, the coal market re reduces their ability to sell the assets that they're planning on selling, mm -hmm. um, you know, that will cause a little hesitation, but I'm still holding because they expect to grow natural gas production by 30% a year for the next three to four, so I believe in that. So the next thing I would want to talk about is the, the natural gas side. I mean, you're seeing prices, um, you know, if, between three to four dollars, three to four and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they're a low cost producer or not. If natural gas prices stayed in this three dollar and fifty cent range for mm -hmm. the next few years, um, and obviously the regulations on the coal market, yep. is this a company you're still holding? So this is a snowball effect. Yeah, if, if both markets start to get pinched, um, I'll get a little worried, but. I, they're in the Marcellus and coal bed methane, and with their experience with coal, they've been able to provide coal bed methane uh, at a pretty reduced price as far as the cost side. Mm -hmm. So they are a lower cost, maybe not as low as an ultra petroleum, but they are low enough to where I would feel confident uh, at the current levels now, you know, below three, who knows, but mm -hmm. uh, at 350 and above, I feel confident. All right, last chance. Last Third chance. Try. And if so, you get them on this, it's a draw. All right, so uh, we, we, know, we know that uh, the thermal coal problems already are, are here. Um, what happens if over the next three years they're going and ta tackling a lot of this natural gas, which is a good move yep. because if, th if thermal coal is too expensive, people are going to move there. What if their costs are escalating on the natural gas that they're drilling? They're not getting the same economics on their wells. $2.5 billion in liquidity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go too far if you're drilling a number of, of new wells, especially expensive wells. Um, so if you see low gas prices and their costs start escalating, say by 20, 30% on a well, are, is this still something that you're holding on to? Probably not, based on the fact that we have to take into account the $3.50 <laughs> per million cubic feet. If it was just rising costs in isolation, I would hold, but due to the compounding effect of this game of chicken, I would be selling if all three of those cases were in effect. All right, it's a draw. Right. And you guys, and and to be to to let our viewers know, you guys did not plan this ahead no, of time. Like you had no idea our, uh, what the threats were. So it is, it's a draw today. And until next time. Until next time. No one has to wear. No one has to wear cocky the chicken. All right, that's going to cover it for today. If you're looking for more energy analysis, you want to check out our special free report. It's called what is it called? Three stocks for America's next energy boom. I should have yeah, that memorized there are some by now. Three popular stocks, so you better read it. Right. So you can get your copy by sending an email to oilboomatfool.com. This mm -hmm. is where you go boom. Boom. Thank like you. That. You can also <laughs> follow us on Twitter at at TMF Energy. Let us know what you think of Taylor's beard, how it stacks up to Matt Copenheffer's. Oh yeah, that means you have to watch where the money is, but not as many times a week as you watch this show. Yeah, tell us where your favorite, please. All right, and for Taylor Muckerman and Joel South, I'm Allison Southwick. Thanks for watching.